All right, so we can go ahead and get started. Um, thanks everyone so much for joining. We're really excited to be here with you all today um, and talk um, about how we can build academic advocacy clinical collaborations. Um, and for today, we're specifically looking at um, how do we form these collaborations for research uh, focused on parental involvement policies that affect care for young people accessing abortion. And so we've got an amazing group of our um, Center for Reproductive Health Research in the Southeast team members, or RISE. Um, really excited to feature the work that they've done and how this relates to their career goals and their advocacy and, and clinical um, aspirations as well. So um, a couple housekeeping things, um, and then we'll do some more intense, um, uh, detailed uh, introductions for everyone too. Uh, so just to get started, we're asking that folks um, start off with audio muted, and then we can um, have time for discussion um, later on. Uh, of course, the video is optional. Uh, feel free to leave it on or off based on your preference. Um, we're encouraging people to use the Q&A function throughout so we can be responding to your questions and comments along the way. Um, and we do have some polls so we can interact um, as a group together. And we'll give you some um, uh, details on how to how to complete those as we go along and hopefully technology will be on our side today. Um, and finally, we want to have, you know, time for detailed group discussion as well. Um, of course, want to share uh, experiences of our panelists here today um, and also talk with you all um, about how this relates to your interests in your work. And so with that, um, we wanted to put down a couple of ground rules. Um, we're asking folks to try to stay present during this session, but of course, feel free to take a break at any time as necessary, take care of yourselves. Um, again, please put questions in the Q&A function throughout. Um, and kind of our approach for today is that we can critique ideas, um, challenge thoughts, um, talk through these issues, but not critique people. Um, and I want to pause there to start to see if folks have any others that they like they'd like to add um, at this point. You can feel free to put them in the Q and A if you'd like, or um, come off mute if that's giving you that option. Wonderful. Well, if anything pops up, um, we can, of course, um, continue to lay these ground rules throughout. Just want to have a good conversation with you all and make sure um, we're, we're taking care of each other. So now let's get into some more um, introductions. And so um, first up, we have Sana Savani, who uses she, her pronouns. Uh, Sana is a recent graduate of the University of Alabama at Birmingham, or UAB and a previous research assistant at RISE. We're so excited to have her back for this presentation. She earned her bachelor's degree in economics with minors in Spanish and chemistry. And she's conducted research with UAB's Department of Psychology on Youth Safety and with UAB School of Public Health on Reproductive Health Access. Sana is currently attending medical school at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. She has a passion for reproductive health care access and social justice and hopes to use her future medical degree to promote these outcomes in marginalized communities. Thanks so much for joining, Senna. Next up, we have Peyton Rogers, who uses she, her pronouns. Peyton is a graduate research assistant at RISE and a project manager intern at Postpartum Support International. Previously, Peyton was a graduate research assistant for the Georgia Access to Medication Abortion Project at Sister Love, Inc. She's pursuing a master's degree in behavioral sciences and health education at the Rollins School of Public Health at Emory University and received a Bachelor of Arts in Public Health from the University of South Carolina in Columbia. Previously, Peyton supported research on low-income women's views about and experiences with immediate postpartum long-acting reversible contraceptive counseling and use in the context of South Carolina's Medicaid policy. 
Payne's interests are in contraception, abortion, and sexual and reproductive health among minority women. Thanks so much for joining today, Peyton. Excited to have you. Next, um, Jai Varshney, it, who also uses she, her pronouns, is a junior at the University of Georgia and a research assistant at RISE. With experiences as an Aaron J. Woolley Fellow at the Feminist Women's Health Center, a legislative aide at the Georgia House of Representatives, and as a summer policy and advocacy intern at Sister Love Inc., Jai hopes to advance reproductive health, rights, and justice for all in both the medical and political spheres. And she's currently an organizing intern for NARAL Pro-Choice Georgia. So excited to have you as well, Jane. And to continue, if I can get the slides to work, Subhashri Narasimhan, who also uses she, her pronouns, completed her PhD in community health sciences at the University of California, Los Angeles Fielding School of Public Health. She is currently a postdoctoral fellow at RISE. And over the course of her career, she's focused on reproductive health in marginalized populations in Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, and the Southern US. Currently, Suba focuses on the impact of policy restrictions on abortion provision and contraceptive use on the health and well-being of women. Recently, she conducted a groundbreaking study examining the rhetoric of legislative debate during early abortion bans across the Southeast. And Suba will also be chatting about her work else, elsewhere in this uh, conference um, this weekend. So we're excited to hear both from her today and um, in other spaces as well. So thanks so much for joining Suba. Um, and finally, um, I'll give you a little information on me. My name is Sophie Hartwig and I also use she, her pronouns. And I'm a co-director of administration and a research project director at RISE. And my work centers in reproductive, maternal, and child health, and I'm especially passionate about qualitative research. At RISE, I guide um, two mixed methods research projects, one examining mandated parental involvement for young people seeking abortion care, which we'll be talking about a little bit more in detail today, and another exploring the impacts of Georgia's 20-week abortion ban. And I have a master's of public health with concentration in behavioral sciences and social contextual determinants of health. So now that we've gone through a lot of details about ourselves, um, wanted to hear from you all. We would love to hear um, your name, your pronouns, where you're located. Um, what brought you to this session? What are you excited about? What are you passionate about? And what are you most interested in, in learning about today? And feel free to come off of mute or put it in the Q&A or chat, um, depending on your preference. Hi, Madison. Hi, Meg. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, Chicago. I grew up in Illinois. <laughs> yeah, it's nice to see so many people from not just Atlanta. So that's great. Meg, we also love partnerships for abortion research. <laughs> Anyone else interested in sharing? Hi, Andy. Tuscaloosa, we've got folks there too. Hi, Sarah. Thanks for joining.
Okay, I'll give it like one more minute if folks want to put their info in the chat and then of course can keep um, introducing throughout um, if that's of interest, but no need to put anybody on the spot either. So I'm um, just excited to be here with you all. I gave it a tiny preview of the next slide so I can just jump to that. I think, oh my goodness, sorry, my mouse is not very cooperative. Um, yeah, oh, hi, Katie. Also from Atlanta. Thanks for joining. I see another person I recognize on the list too. Hi, Missy. Great. Well, we can keep going along, but of course, keep keep using the Q&A function and the chat function, however you'd like. Um, I think to get us started, have, if at all, you know, what have um, folks heard about parental involvement policies, uh, specifically for young people seeking abortion care? Can be any and all answers to. Hi, Patty. Glad you can join us. Yeah, definitely. And as I'm saying, mostly show in the form of parental consent or notice from Jess requiring parental consent for accessing abortion if you're under 18. Mm -hmm. Sarah says it's cumbersome um, and oftentimes extremely traumatizing to have to go through the judicial bypass process, too many barriers. I miss the, yeah, Jess saying judicial bypass is an option, but then that extends your pregnancy. Totally. Meg says Kentucky requires parental consent. We had an abortion fund and work closely with the city's attorneys, city and attorneys to support minors seeking judicial bypasses. Oh, and great call, Sana. Thank you for alerting um, to, I should have called this out already. If you would like everyone to see your chat, make sure it's changed to all panelists and attendees. But of course, you're welcome to share with just us too. Thanks so much, Lena. I think I made that mistake right at the beginning too. Yeah, that's why I noticed it. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, and we'll try to call out um, what folks are sharing in the chat too, um, as long as that's as like it's comfortable. But totally, it sounds like a lot of folks are familiar with parental involvement policies for young people already, and some of the variety is is already kind of coming out from location to location there. Awesome. So I think now we've got kind of just a way to to get us started with. Um, getting a sense of the whole group via a chat. Um, and so here we've got our poll, our first poll of, do you know about your state in particular, their um, parental involvement policies for young people seeking abortion care. I'm gonna put the, the link to the poll in the chat and I can call it out um, verbally too. It's P-O-L-L-E-V dot com forward slash S-U-B-A-N 707. I know sometimes my chat doesn't let me copy and paste, so um, at least it's a short link. Um, I'm gonna make sure it's activated. Give folks a few minutes, like a minute or so to respond. Looks like we are getting some responses already. And I'll call out before I share the, the results from the poll. It'll have like a text thing that you can do to respond to these polls at the top. You can just ignore that. We're just gonna use the, the link for ease today. We'll give it one more minute. And let us know too, using the Q&A function, if you're having trouble with like the polls or any technology or anything throughout, um, so we're not um, moving forward without you. 
All right, I am going to share our results from our first poll. Make sure, can folks, can folks see that new screen? Yeah, great, thanks. Looks like everybody does. <laughs> everybody that's responded at least. So yeah, like we were saying, we've got a lot of folks here with a lot of experience um, on young people accessing abortion care, um, which I think will help ground our conversation too, but um, you know, we'll all have unique experiences to bring to the, to the table as well. So excited to get into that more. Okay, I'm gonna get back to our slides. And we've got one more poll for you all too. This next one, um, we're hoping to get your sense of, and don't respond quite yet because I need, I think I need to activate this poll um, before you refresh your screens, but what percentage of minors involve adults in abortion decisions? Um, and for this question, we're specifically interested in what percentage do you think involve a parent regardless of what the law requires? I'm going to go back and activate this poll. And then what you can do is you can just, um, in just a moment, you'll just be able to like refresh that link. Um, and it looks like folks are already getting there and able to respond. So I think, um, there we go. All right. And I'm going to not show the results quite yet. I'll keep it posted on my side and give folks more chance to respond as well. Um, but I'm going to bounce it over to um, Suba to give us a little more context and then we'll come back to the poll results. All right, Suba, take it away. Sure. Um, thank you everyone for being here on this Saturday morning. We're really excited to have you all and to discuss both research advocacy and a little bit of clinical partnership. Um, primarily, we're focusing on kind of the research advocacy given the experiences of all of the people on the panel today. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of a background on um, parental involvement laws generally, but also in the states that we looked at. And it looks like in terms of this group, you all are extremely knowledgeable about uh, abortion related parental involvement laws, which um, is really exciting because that's uh, pretty uncommon, frankly, for um, most groups. Most people, especially young people, really don't know what the parental, the re exact requirements of parental involvement laws are in their state. And that changes very um, drastically from state to state. So as of June 2019, I said it's 37 states that require parental notice or consent for minors abortion. It's between 36 and 37 if you look at um, the data. Advocates for Youth puts it at around um, 36 states, and I've gotten most of my data from Advocates for Youth, which has a really great uh, web page um, kind of distilling all of the laws around parental involvement. Um, in Georgia, um, there's parental uh, notice or notification, and um, that just requires a certified letter to um, a, a parental home address. That doesn't necessarily require um, any other kinds of documentation beyond that, and the clinic usually keeps the certification of the letter. Um, in Alabama, there is parental consent, which is a requirement where a parent has to, at least one parent who is on your birth certificate, has to attend your appointment and uh, sign a, a consent form in clinic. Um, and Mississippi has what we would say one of the most stringent laws, which is the consent of two parents. So both parents, which all they also must be listed on the birth certificate. So those are the two parents that are listed on your birth certificate um, uh, must be present at the appointment and provide consent or at least provide consent on, um, on a form, even if only one parent is present at the appointment. So you can, you know, you can see from, from like a layperson standpoint, maybe person who doesn't work in abortion work, um, they might consider this to be, you know, a routine kind of uh, requirement. It makes sense to involve a parent uh, in this kind of decision making. But uh, as all of us on this panel seem to be pretty knowledgeable, parental notification, parental consent laws actually create 
additional barriers to, um, to uh, uh, obtaining an abortion for a minor. Um, and in 21 states, I found out recently, um, they require parental involvement even if a minor is a victim of incest. And so you can see that there's a lot of gray areas in this, um, in, in this process. And currently almost every state that has a parental notification or consent law also has a form of court involvement uh, called a judicial bypass to, to bypass the, the um, parental involvement. But that process is very unknown to minors and has a lot of loopholes to jump through. So all of this stuff, these, these extra laws and requirements really fall under this concept of abortion exceptionalism, where we're creating even more restrictions on abortion to make it more difficult to obtain, despite the safety of the procedure. And uh, above and beyond what we would require uh, of any other type of reproductive health procedure. Oh, next slide. All right, so I will come back on to show the results from the poll here before um, we get back to it. Here we go. All right, so it looks like we've got some um, uh, mixed opinions here with 17% um, feeling that less than 10% of minors involve adults in abortion decisions regardless of what the requ law requires. Also 17% with 60% response. And then for both the 30% and more than 90%, we've got 33% of our attendees polling there. So I'm gonna jump back to the slides now and let Suba share that. So, and in, oh, I'm sorry, Suba. <laughs> you're okay. An increasing number of studies are really looking at the, in the impact of these parental involvement laws, not only on, um, the experiences of minors, but really the experiences of people providing care within the health and uh, judicial systems. Um, and so there are there is data out of um, Texas, Colorado, um, and particularly they focus on minors seeking this process of judicial bypass. And we can tell you from the work that we've done that judicial price bypass is actually a very rare um, occurrence. It's, it's not um, something that's very um, easily obtainable or the information is like very easily um, uh, available. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit. Our study particularly in Georgia looked at a bunch of different areas and that's what's incredibly exciting. And we also focused on minors who actually choose to involve their parent. And um, in a few minutes, I'll tell you the answer to that poll as well. So, um, which is really unique. We, we're looking at, um, looking at minors who choose to involve a parent and what that was like. And if, if the parental involvement laws created a barrier for them, irrespective of the fact that their parent was available. Um, so uh, we looked at perceptions and experiences of minors um, we also looked at perceptions and experiences of health providers, and this um, is not just doctors who provide care, but all manner of people within clinic systems who are helping a minor through the abortion experience process. Um, we also connected with lawyers, particularly at groups like If When How, um, to uh, get a uh, get an understanding of both the judicial bypass process, but also uh, what they kind of, um, what they talk to minors about when they're considering judicial bypass. And then finally, we looked at other stakeholders within the system that you might not consider. And this was really about looking at the system as a whole. So we're looking at the barriers and facilitators to both judicial bypass and these experiences of um, abortion care that minors are seeking. And finally, um, from a quantitative and like uh, larger state level perspective, we wanted to look at the trends in minors seeking abortion services. So are they getting abortions at later gestational ages in these states? Um, our work only focused on the three states that I mentioned before, Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi. But we know that Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi have a, a very, very um, uh, 
difficult culture when it comes to their a very hostile climate around abortion. Next slide. And I'm just going to dig in really quickly into how we looked at this. So um, this, this larger project, this um, confidentiality and parental involvement processes project that we call CPI for short, um, involved a number of different research avenues. So there was qualitative interviews, which looked at, um, did, we did interviews with minors, clinic personnel, and legal stakeholders. Um, and uh, Peyton is actually going to talk a little bit about that in her uh, research work. We did quantitative data abstraction. So we physically went to abortion clinics around in major uh, cities in the states that we um, that uh, we were looking at. And we looked at clinic charts and records and then also took state level ITOP data, which is um, uh, reporting data that all clinics are required to report. Um, and then finally, we did a really unique study, a mystery call uh, study to county courts. And I'm not gonna describe that in too much detail because uh, Sana Jai and Peyton will all describe that. Next slide. So actually, the answer to the poll is pretty surprising for most people. If they can involve a parent, most minors do involve a parent. And some of them are absolutely pushed to involve their parent. They find that um, parental involvement is way easier than going through the court process. But most minors look to their parents or a trusted adult or caregiver first, um, irrespective of the law, because generally minors are relatively thoughtful in their decision-making, just like any other group of people. And um, they're looking for help through the process and also understand as uh, a person under 18, they may not have access to the health system or may not understand the health system like a, a mother or a, an older sister or somebody like that might. So that's the answer to the poll question. Thanks for your patience with building extra suspense on that one. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So now we're going to dive into talking a little bit about what does what in the CPI project we really focused on this kind of idea of an academic advocacy clinical partnership. And now um, we're going to have um, Sana Jai and Peyton describe. Um, uh, what this actually looked like from their from their perspective and like what activities they actually engaged in. So take it away, Peyton. Okay. Again, thank you guys for coming out today virtually. Um, so again, my name is Peyton. And so for academic advocacy clinical partnership, um, that can involve, like we said before, qualitative research and like we discussed previously. And I was involved in the data analysis um, portion and transcribe encoded mystery call transcripts. So we used the following codes um, because we I felt like they were most important for our analysis and truly represented it, the um, importance of minors trying to seek abortions and services from staff within the community. So the first code we used was little was known about what a judicial bypass was um, in the process in mystery calls. So there were comments that demonstrated that court personnel had never heard of or even knew what a judicial bypass was, which is very surprising. And um, we also use, I don't know, comments from people working in um, the Chantry or juvenile court, and they also had little to no information about a judicial bypass. And we use the main code blurred boundaries um, to represent personal comments about abortion, adoption, teen pregnancy, and a parent's parental involvement. Um, and that just reflected staff inserting themselves into minors' personal lives instead of giving them the proper information about what a judicial by bypass was and its process. So I was also involved in the transcribing and coding um, for the interviews for minors seeking an abortion. And this was the biggest, the biggest trend that I was that we were finding in um, within the interviews was among minors decision making. So during our analysis, we use codes um, such as options or discussions to reflect the minors decision making process. And 
this just reflected that minors revealed that they thought about and discussed different alternatives before making a concrete decision and at least included one person into their decision making process. So they had thoughts and discussions that were centered around abortion and the abortion types. Um, per, um, parenting was something that they were also considering as an option and they were basing their decisions off of either observing other parenting styles in their families or within different peer groups. Um, they were also thinking about adoption and that stigma associated with, adop with, with adoption and um, the last alternative was based on comments about how no option was really right for them at the time um, and that was just showing how they were all really thinking through um, their decision before making something concrete. You can go ahead. You can go ahead, Sophie, <laughs> thank you. Um, so this quote was taken from one of the minor interviews um, transcripts. And what I love most about it is how personal and relevant it is because it truly shows the decision-making or thought process that the minors went through or young women were, were going through and trying to seek an abortion. So the last part, um, in my opinion, is the most important because it dives into the importance of having autonomy and how young women should be able to freely make their own decisions about their health. You can go ahead. <laughs> Would you mind reading that aloud for us? I think you're right, it's so powerful. So the quote says, legally, I can go to the doctor by myself because I'm pregnant, you don't need your mom, but I needed her consent so I could get an abortion, which doesn't make sense. If I'm able to go to the hospital by myself, I should be able to do whatever by myself because I know what I know right from wrong. All right. Hey, everyone. I'm Sana. Um, my, so my primary role in this study was to serve as a research assistant making those mystery calls that Suba talked about. So mystery calls are a really unique way to gather research data that's a little bit different from like participant interviews. Um, so I used a script um, in which I was seeking information for a friend about how to get an abortion without um, her parents' consent. And I made these mystery calls to counties in Alabama, Mississippi, and Georgia. Um, as for like the data that I gathered, I think it was very rare for me to get the information that I needed. And the most often response I got was like, oh, honey, I don't know. Um, so often the call was like short or it ended with an apology um, or like no good information. I was often referred to other places like um, abortion clinics or law offices. Um, people told me to just look it up on Google or that this wasn't a possibility for my friend to get an abortion without telling her parents. Um, secondarily, my role was to edit um, call recordings for what we call usable data um, in order for us to gather good um, qualitative information. Um, so that involved me just cutting out dead air um, or extensive wait times um, from being transferred from department to department to try to get to where I needed to go. Uh, I'm sure all of you have been through that kind of frustrating process where you call a core doctor's office or even like Walmart trying to get to someone um, who can answer your question. And so imagine that tenfold since no one knew what I was talking about. Um, but it's important to note that a minor would probably be making these kinds of calls during lunchtime or odd times where they can like get away from the classroom or get away from their parents. And so I think that definitely plays a role in the kind of service I was able to get like calls around 11 or 12. Um, it, they weren't very, very successful. Um, I got a lot of voicemails and things like that. Um, but one of my favorite, not one of my favorite, but one of the most outstanding uh, conversations I had was this quote on the next slide. Um, when Sophie gets to it, I'll read it to you all. Um, the woman, she was really helpful on the phone, honestly, one of the more helpful people. And I was like about to hang up and she ends the call with, um, if you change your mind and don't want a baby, I would take it. I'm just telling you my name's so-and-so and I work here and I would take it gladly. So that's a little bit of a, a blurred boundary, as Peyton would say. Hey, everyone. Um, so I did a similar thing to Sana and Peyton. I was uh, tasked with doing the mystery calls. Most of mine were concentrated in Georgia. I did a few in Alabama and Mississippi. And so what that entailed was just following the script. Um, as a minor seeking an abortion, or as a friend of a minor seeking an abortion. Um, and so I noticed that generally 
almost no court was prepared to help a minor with this. Um, either they were completely unhelpful or if they were helpful, they often put me on hold um, for a while, um, which kind of shows like a, a lack of um, available information at the time of calling. Um, and I also worked in translation. So what that uh, involved was uh, writing and designing one pagers to, I guess, convey the information that we learned through this project to our clinic partners, and other um, community partners. Um, and then I also have a, a quote from My Mystery Calls in the next slide. Um, and it says, I don't want to say, go get rid of your baby. And then you come back to me 20 years later and, and I feel bad. I mean, um, I don't know. I mean, do you go to church? What's your pastor's name? Maybe you go talk to your pastor. I think this was in Alabama and I'm pretty, the person on the other side, on the other side of the phone sounded um, like a man. Um, so that was definitely like a blurred boundary as um, Sana and uh, Peyton mentioned. So um, you all talked really um, like greatly about your research activities and they were really interesting, particularly, I think, so personal, um, uh, you know, being mystery callers, being young women who are calling these courts just like um, uh, another young woman would. And even though you sort of had like one step removed where you were like, this is for my friend, I feel like the automatic assumption was that you all were calling for yourselves. Uh, am I correct about that? So given the perception and the things that you've done both through the interviews and the mystery callers, what um, impact do you feel like this kind of research work has on minors? Or what do you hope it has on minors? Oh, next slide. <laughs> Okay, we're there now. Okay, so um, yeah, <laughs> that's okay. Um, so yeah, um, I think personally, it's important to highlight the fact that, um, you know, minors were able to go through a decision making process and still think about their options before making a concrete decision. Um, so they actually had well thought out decisions, but this is where you often see the gap. And people often think that, you know, minors are making unintelligent and rash or, you know, even harmful decisions, but the data shows that minors are in fact thinking through their decisions about their health and are able to make, you know, informed and independent decisions. And um, although this decision was mainly theirs, they, it's important to also note that they still included at least someone into their process. They had discussions with friends, parents, or even, you know, people they were intimately involved with. And they were knowledgeable or somewhat knowledgeable about what an abortion was, the process and even the types of an abortion. And, but with this being said, this was still one of the hardest decisions they had to make. And also one of the most important because of their age and future plans and situations. So with all of that being said, I think this research is impacting young women and showing the importance of how minors should not have to jump through hoops to get the information and resources they need to have an abortion or really any reproductive health service. And frankly, um, this also is showing that staff should not make the process harder by their lack of knowledge. And in another realm, this research, this research is helping amplify young women in a way because through qualitative research, you're able to speak up for their needs when young women are unable to um, in reproductive health. All right, so for me, um, I will say that no one really asked directly on the phone, like, why are you getting an abortion? But you could tell that they were like caught off guard or, you know, why is your friend getting an abortion? Um, like, as soon as I just even said the word, you could tell there was like a pause. Um, so that was a little bit uncomfortable. Um, even if the courts did know about judicial bypass, they weren't able to give me accurate and correct information about it. Um, and in the rare case that I like was able to get something of truth, it was after I like pushed and asked a lot of questions, um, which I'm not sure a minor in this exact situation would be able to do or have the knowledge to do. Um, I would say that like, um, even if they did give like the good procedure, the second like secondary question I would ask is like, 
oh, well, my parents find out. And I was often incorrectly informed that they would, um, which is kind of like fear inducing in a minor um, and also more inaccurate information. So um, all of this, as Peyton says, serves as like a barrier um, for reproductive health access. Um, additionally, being like put in the shoes of a minor making these calls, I know like I, I'm pretty sensitive. So I took a lot of it, you know, like the tones um, were kind of discouraging. It left me confused in terms of access and just like confused emotionally as well. Um, I was often like told to call a lawyer without knowing like, I mean, I still at age 22 don't really know like what I would bring to a lawyer, um, how much it would cost. Um, other times I was offered options like um, telling my friend to emancipate herself from her parents. And so that's also a very stressful kind of situation. Um, so it was definitely difficult to handle from the perspective of a minor. Um, and then overall, I guess just the impact of um, this lack of information in the courts would lead to either a minor having to inform their parents or more difficult or complicated options um, and just an overall failure to get proper reproductive health care. Yeah, so in my experience during the mystery calls, um, I think Sana and Peyton kind of already touched on this, but clerks uh, were often condescending, judgmental, or just um, downright unhelpful. Um, but when I was given information, it, it didn't necessarily mean that that interaction was helpful also. So like Sana said, they would often refer you to an attorney or a lawyer, but never actually mentioned like a specific person. Um, and think about an attorney, like I, I I suppose an attorney like could be helpful explaining to the minor like what the judicial bypass process is, but the a, an attorney is probably out of reach for a minor. And like Sana said, it's like how would they even know like what to say to such a, to an attorney. Um, also, uh, I was referred to health clinics a lot, and so they have next to no authority in this whole process, which wouldn't be super helpful. Um, and then I was even referred to a crisis pregnancy center a few times, um, which are anti. Um, which are clinic or fake clinics that basically um, their mission is to convince people to not get an abortion. And so that could be pretty um, disastrous. And so just like through my experience, it's clear that um, judicial bypass is not a process that's familiar to most court staff. So finally, I know um, all of you are um, in the beginning stages of working on your research, but um, most of you, um, all of you all have advocacy and personal connections to the work. Could you talk a little bit about what um, your advocacy and personal connections are? Okay, so advocacy for youth. Um, so the climate we're in today, I feel like it's especially important that we are raising awareness and continuing to advocating and addressing abortion access for young women and making sure um, their needs are centered and met because young women should not um, feel guilt or shame when trying to access these services. And again, like I said before, um, all women deserve to make informed and independent decisions about their reproductive health. And this dives a little bit into the reproductive justice framework and looking at how you know, all women um, and girls have access to reproductive health um, and have complete economic, social, political, and um, political power and the resources and services they need to make decisions. And most importantly, their own decisions about their bodies. And when these needs aren't met, obviously this means the framework falls short and is not achieved. So this is definitely something we see that um, we're struggling with today. And um, destigmatizing the term is, and making it less shameful, the term of abortion and making it less shameful, but beneficial to help meet whatever need a young woman may have, um, I think is also important because abortion stigma is one of the main barriers to women seeking abortion services and resources. And this fear and stigma can translate into shame and silence and women's needs not being met. So this can also create or, um, you know, perpetuate myths and misunderstandings about abortion. So lastly, increasing knowledge among stakeholders, um, community members, and any other influential people in the community so that they become knowledgeable about abortion and are able to connect young women with proper resources and services, regardless of their views. 
you can go ahead, Sophie. <laughs> Did it advance for you this time? It's it's advanced, I think. Okay, thank you. Um, so yeah, I have been involved in um, a lot of reproductive health research over the years. Again, in undergrad, I was involved with um, patients, uh, a study that was involving um, South Carolina's immediate postpartum LARC contraceptive Medicaid policy, even with the Gamma Project in Georgia, where we're examining how Black and Latino women think about and experience medication abortion to the research we're discussing now. And even with being a peer health educator in undergrad and facilitating um, sex ed classes and seeing the lack of awareness about abortion, its services and resources, and how abortion is not even included in the curriculum. So which leads to not being knowledgeable about the topic. And I'm not going to go into detail about all of those experiences due to time, but this, all of these experiences have just shown me over the years that there are still gaps among young women trying to access high quality reproductive and sexual health. Um, there's a lack of knowledge, a lack of patient provider support, um, communication, stigma, fear, um, and just, again, women's needs not being met. So. We are a ways away in reproductive health and getting and achieving that reproductive justice framework. And we need more public health and reproductive justice, justice activists to continue speaking up and advocating and bring, bring in awareness and outreach, outreach to um, the issues we are facing in healthcare. So with this, I want to use my research um, background and education in public health to advance and improve um, health um, reproductive health and rights among women, especially um, young um, minority women and Black women who are marginalized in healthcare, um, to make sure they're having and are able to access high quality healthcare in our country. All right. So um, for me, what was unique about this research position was seeing how like research and data collection can channel into advocacy work. Um, and the facet that stood out to me most was that there is a lot of room to educate um, general court staff about the general and judicial bypass process. Um, we as like citizens expect to be able to reach out to like our courts about information about proceedings, just like you would expect to reach out to your doctor about information about procedures or um, your even like your hairstylist about information about, you know, your haircut. So um, I think it's important that they uh, fulfill this role in our society. Um, and I think that advocates can use the information found in studies like these to increase education on like minor options and help destroy barriers for minors in needs of abortion. So for example, the two gaps that I see are policies that require parental involvement in a minor's decision to have an abortion, um, the fact that they're restrictive and they need to be addressed. And then secondly, quality and availability of information that courts provide to minors seeking an abortion um, needs to be corrected and improved. It's really been discouraging to realize how poorly informed the courts are about the existence of judi judicial bypass, sorry, let alone the steps required to achieve the judicial bypass. Um, so I guess my conclusion there is that researchers and advocates um, really need to work together to find out um, in these cases, geographically, where these gaps exist and specifically what information is missing in order to start correcting some of these barriers. And um, for personal um, advocacy experiences, um, it's been really cool to come work for this study after building an advocacy background centered around reproductive justice. Uh, I've worked through my time at UAB um, to do phone banking and canvassing for candidates that support abortion access like um, Doug Jones in Alabama, or against initiatives that would largely diminish um, abortion access. Um, again, there was an amendment to an Alabama um, that ended up passing, but it takes away the right to abortion and abortion funding. Um, so while there are both losses and win wins in the realm of abortion access, I think it's important to recognize that like advocacy work that I will do in the future depends on um, people who are seeking abortions, including minors, to be properly informed of their rights. And so like none of the work that we do um, regarding access like is um, like we'll be able to come to fruition if we don't have the proper education needs. 
Um, and so I have done a bit of education work through my time at UAB, where I served as president of URGE, Unite for Reproductive and Gender Equity. Shout out to Andy, who's here, who was one of my advisors. Um, so um, through URGE, I helped start Sex Education Week on campus, which was similar to what Peyton was doing as well. We talked about safe sex and consent. Um, and also participated in URGE's campaign for Abortion Positive Day, which helped uh, remove the stigma around abortion um, and made it more like mainstream for people on campus at least. Uh, and I see potential for events like these to like expand and include education of reproductive rights and even advocacy opportunities to like lobby the courts um, based on the needed outcomes that are indicated by studies like these. Um, and lastly, um, as a future physician, I really hope to like combine what um, my medical expertise with research like this to better advocate for and ensure reproductive health access, agency, and safe lives for all of my patients, especially those in marginalized communities. Um, thank you. Um, so I worked on the translation uh, core for this project. Um, and so like I said, I worked on three one pagers. Uh, they were about mystery calls um, and two other things that I'm forgetting right now. But the point of those was to sum up research papers in a way that was digestible for our community partners. Um, and so specifically, the one page I wrote on mystery calls um, include info on judicial bypass, uh, the parental involvement law in Georgia, um, a general script, and then um, our primary findings. At the time that I wrote the one pager though, we hadn't like finalized a lot of the results. And so that was just like very, um, very, uh, I guess like, yeah, primary findings. Um, and so some changes I had to make as I was um, translating this from uh, the academic sphere to the, I guess, advocacy and clinical sphere, I avoided jargon in the, uh, the text of the one pager. Um, I kept the description simple while still, um, maintaining the big picture of the project. And I also wrote an active voice. I find that a lot of academic papers are written in passive voice, which makes it extremely hard to read. Um, and so, yeah, I think that changed. I think some papers are changing to write an active voice, but that is a change that I, um, that was very important to me. Um, and so being able to translate research um, to benefit community partners is crucial um, because it's like you're, we took up the time of our clinical partners. And so the least that we could do is to give this information back to them in a way that benefits them. Um, and so personally, uh, learning about the parental involvement laws in Georgia and other states, um, it helped me with my current position as a organizer with Advocates for Youth. I'm working on the Abortion Out Loud project, which is a national project that uh, its stated goal is to uh, end parental involvement laws. So that's a very strong connection there. I think learning about the parental involvement laws through research um, definitely informed um, my current position. Um, and also I organized with NARAL Pro-Choice Georgia. And so learning about abortion restrictions in general has been really helpful for that. Um, like I said, um, having a solid foundation in research um, allows you to better personally advocate for those issues. All right, so we've got a little bit of time left um, to kind of dive in um, to the um, kind of discussion of what we've talked about today and to hear from you all a little bit more. To kick off our discussion, um, we are going to do one final poll, and I believe I just activated it. Um, and so if you want to go ahead and um, respond to this, that would be great. We're interested in getting a sense of where you get new information about reproductive health. Um, for this one, it's not a choose all that apply. So if you can pick your primary or primary preferred source, that'd be great. Um, I think we're asking this too in the context of like, how are we um, elevating findings with thought to where young people get information about re reproductive health too. So um, kind of how we're framing it here, but would love to hear from you all in this too. We also want to give a shout out to tomorrow. Um, Katie uh, Singh, who's on our panel, is one of the presenters for a knowledge justice panel. It's tomorrow at 11 a.m. And uh, you can learn. Uh, it's a very going to be a very interactive panel. And 
also will give you more information about kind of the ethos of RISE and, and what we're thinking about in terms of, of changing knowledge paradigms between research advocacy and clinical practice. And um, we also, I will be presenting a panel tomorrow particularly on a uh, legislative debate of early abortion bans. So at RISE, we're trying really hard to look at new forms of data that might give us new insights into how different group stakeholders are thinking about abortion and abortion rights. So just a quick plug there. Um, it is also tomorrow at 11, so you'll have to choose, apologies. <laughs> so many good options. All right, and I'll reveal the poll now. Looks like the majority or are, are, are half here are, are going to internet or Google for their information about reproductive health and a quarter each to healthcare providers or another source. I think we are going to have maybe, oh, and it looks like we're, we're even changing in real time here with more folks going toward internet Google. Um, and yeah, feel free to plug in the chat if you've got other sources that um, are where you go for new information. Yeah, and I think this, like like um, we've attested to here too, and and Jay was just talking about, you know, how do we how do we take what we're learning from this research? How do we connect with folks in different areas and recognizing too that like, you know, publication and and you know certification of findings and research spaces that's that's good, but this is directly affecting young people. How do we get young people involved? How do we get people? Um, thinking about this and and having more kind of accessibility to this type of information about what these um, requirements are and how they actually affect people in their in their real lives. So I'm going to go back to the slides now. All right. And we've got some discussion questions that we'd love to talk with you all today. Um, kind of reflecting on what we've talked about um, um, between all of our panelists. And then um, we know you all are coming with a lot of expertise in these areas too. Um, so really interested to hear about your thoughts um, first on what, um, what are strategies that we can all implement to build strong academic and advocacy um, partnerships going forward and really connect these spheres um, going forward. We're really interested in hearing about some of your uh, personal reflections on the barriers as well to some of these partnerships. What we found through the work that we've done in RISE, which has been really intentional about trying to connect different silos. Um, so people interact with different um, knowledge spheres and uh, different stakeholders every single day when they're getting healthcare. For example, in this, in this panel, you know, we talked about uh, health providers who are providing the service, but also the knowledge flow around court systems and uh, a minor's personal um, information that they come in with or that they research or their family researches with them uh, before they come in for their appointment. What happens and what we saw in, um, in this full project was that there's not a lot of talking between these groups. So there's a lot of uh, fear and misinformation that minors will go into appointments with um, unless they've had someone close to them um, that has gone through an experience to guide them. They may have certain ideas about what the experience is gonna be like. And then trying to seek out information, particularly between health providers and the courts, there's a huge chasm there. And um, there's very little talking going on between um, these two uh, these two groups of stakeholders. So Rise is at at every juncture trying to create, um, in small and large ways, um, a, a way to to give evidence based information to all the people that might be involved in the in the care continuum. So Meg says, um, there is an ethical struggle when surveying vulnerable populations. Ideally, research participants will be compensated for their emotional labor, labor and there are not a lot of resources to pay researchers or subjects. That's a, that's a really good point. Um, I think from the, the research paradigm struggle, there is a lot 
um, especially from academic institutions to, um, to uh, advocacy groups, there's different ways of working uh, regarding money and there's very little transparency or understanding of the processes between the two. And also you're right there, when we're looking at vulnerable populations, the people who are doing the research may not be of the community. And so I think um, one thing that Peyton uh, talked about was uh, the Gamma project that she's involved in. Um, and uh, the Gamma project really is a community led project, which is trying to break some of the barriers there. Uh, Peyton, do you wanna describe uh, a little bit about what you all have done in the Gamma Project to try to make this a little, little bit different. And I know, Meg, um, some of what you're talking about is, is the financial resources too. Yes, so I came in um, a little late to the project. So I was doing what, most of the analysis portion, um, but what the research really focused on was looking at um, Black and Latinas views on um, Latinx views on medication abortion and um, if they've used it, experienced it, or um, their knowledge about it. Um, and there was a lot of lack of knowledge about um, mostly centered around the abortion types. Um, medication abortion is something that really not a lot of people know about and it just gets into and also not having access to it as well. So um, through this, um, we were able to take this analysis and um, what we found and the data that we found and um, we're still in the stages. Well, I think they're still in the stages of um, taking this research and putting it within the community. Um, so that can be through like we have done newsletters um, recently. Um, we're gonna do a, um, a video that we're able to also um, have people in the community or community partners access. Um, so we can tell them strategies about um, how to um, discuss or um, have conversations centered around abortion um, and how they can become more knowledgeable about it. Thanks, Peyton. And I'll jump in too to say that I think um, recognizing our pos positionality in, in how we're conducting this research has been a part of the project from, from the get-go. And I think we'll always have to continue to refine and, and strengthen that aspect of how we're doing the work. Um, some of the things that we thought about um, up front, um, especially in talking to young people who may or may not have involved a parent in their abortion decision is how do research consents work, right? And like, how do parents, how, you know, do institutional review boards or approval boards typically want parents to be involved in that process too? So for our study, we made sure to like waive that component where if a young person's participating in an interview with us, um, they're giving consent for that interview and they are being compensated for their time at the same rate that we compensated clinic personnel and legal representatives too. We talked a lot about like, we wanna make sure those amounts aren't coercive, but they were giving equal value to their time as we are to other stakeholders in this process. Um, I think we can obviously continue to, to do more um, and push back on systems that aren't, aren't centering young people and young people's voices in the research process, but like, how else can we be doing this? How else can we push back on those, um, those barriers to those types of partnerships? And also like Suba, you're saying like, draw these areas together too. I think another uh, area that we have focused on in this project is making sure, um, as Meg said, that there are there's representation from groups that are actually affected uh, by this, but also, you cannot do research ethically if you do not compensate people ethically. And that's been something that is, if you don't have the money as a research group to, to think about equitable compensation, you are likely uh, not funded, like, like you have to reconsider doing the project. If you think that you can only give people for their, their 
their experience and knowledge much less than you feel like you're providing for someone who has a higher degree or something like that, um, but you're asking similar questions to them, then, then you've inherently created an inequitable system, right? So we think about that over and over and over again and try very hard to make sure that, um, that, that young people um, are compensated at the same level that an adult would be compensated for their time and their expertise. Um, because we are asking them specific questions because we think that they know something that, uh, that other people don't. Um, uh, Jess uh, has said, um, I'm coming at this conversation from an advocacy perspective. So it feels important that there's an action associated with research being conducted. For example, if you're pulling on abortion messaging and then some kind of community education campaign should follow. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think there's also a huge lag time between both the activities of research and the needs of advocacy. And I think that that's one of the, the, the things that we really struggle with is that sometimes it takes a really long time to finish a research project, but um, advocacy groups need information um, quick, more quickly, you know? And so it's always important to, uh, if, if you have a primary advocacy group in your city or um, uh, in your state that is the, the premier group that's advocating on behalf of the community um, for an issue, they should be involved in some of the, the research design or research thinking um, and also uh, be equitably compensated for that as well. So. And I'll add there to um, not as much for the mystery calls that we made to county courts, um, not as much for that component, but the other components we've had partnering abortion clinics that we've worked with over the course of this entire project, um, involving them from the onset of the project so that they can have um, uh, the ability to inform where the project goes and that we can have buy-in from folks at different levels and recognizing that um, even though our, our, our project has like officially wrapped up at this stage, we're still working on those summary one pagers that Jai was talking about. We're still working on like what are other ways we can make this information actually useful for people doing the work? How can we like make recommendations for like actually you know, if we know that co courts aren't providing this information, how can we support other people in supplementing the information provided? Like where can we um, put findings from our research to better inform change and support people that are supporting young folks, right? And then obviously getting word out to young people themselves, um, getting young people excited in and invested in the research project process side of things too, I think is, is another exciting area. Um, but also a challenge too, right? Like reaching out to young people to participate in interviews, for instance, even it's a sensitive topic and folks may not be comfortable talking with us. We know researchers aren't always as careful with people's information and really like uplifting people's stories. So how do we combat some of those barriers and people's resistance or reluctance to share their stories and really show and build that trust? Um, I think that's needed on researchers side of things. Um, the rest of the panelists feel free to chime in, but I think we need to advance to the next slide. Unfortunately, we're coming to the end of our time here. Um, so if you all could just tell us um, in the chat function, just one thing that you learned about parental involvement in this session, uh, if anything that you didn't know or didn't, or at least something that this session brought to mind, that would be incredibly useful for us. Um, I think one of the really interesting parts of this work is um, uh, the need to really bolster um, correct information about judicial bypass and correct information about how minors make their decisions. For example, the term emancipation came up a lot, both amongst clinic providers and courts and even minors. And there is no need to be emancipated, meaning legally uh, severed from your parents' custody uh, in order to get a judicial bypass. 
And so that kind of information, those are like small pieces of information that if we didn't, if we weren't looking at the entirety of the picture of the system, we might have missed, you know? So anybody want to chime in, um, add some last thoughts? I think we're, we're at the end of time. So um, if you'd advance the slide, Sophie. Um, in closing, we just wanted to give you a couple resources. If, when, how, um, Atlanta Volunteers Foundation and Advocates for Youth all have great um, resources on judicial bypass. And we really wanted to thank our interview participants who uh, were all young people who are really um, um, uh, great and eager to talk to us. Other research assistants, uh, Kelly Reyna and Seabrook Jeffcoat and the rest of the RISE team and partners. And finally, if you have any other questions that you want to continue in the conversation, here are all our information, uh, Twitter handles, uh, emails, and please feel free to reach out to us. Thank you. Thanks so much for being here, everybody, and to our amazing um, panelists. I'm going to give a, a round of applause.